Um, please introduce Jack Hitter. Thank you, Chuck. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me here. Hello to the other offices as well. Um, I want to really get to Q&A in, in a few minutes, but let me just share first two stories of mentorship. Um, I got a sense of the culture here at Next Jump, and mentorship is one of the key things uh, that I see going on here. Are people here in mentorship relationships right now in, uh, in the company? Um, almost everybody, I guess, right? Yeah, or, absolutely. Um, so let me just share two stories of mentorship. Um, after I'd taken my company public, ran it for a number of years as a public company, was chairman and CEO of that company, uh, had to meet and, and beat all the street expectations, run a company that had uh, offices nationwide and worldwide, a lot of fun to do that. I then handed it off to the next uh, management team, and they've done a great job as well, taking it to the next level. Uh, and today the company's doing great on, on the New York Stock Exchange now. Um, but I then heard about something called microfinance or microenterprise. Has anyone here heard of microfinance? Do you know what microfinance is? Or do you? Yeah, uh, I mean, microfinance was an econ major. Um, so basically, it's giving very small loans to you know, uh, you know, kind of poorer countries, and then you know, they're able to pay it back and start businesses with it. Exactly. So um, traditionally, microfinance has been in developing countries, has been where you identify low income individuals, you help them start a business, usually with very, very small loans. Uh, and it's been very successful around the world. Well, I heard about that, and I heard that some people want to try to do it right here in New York City. And so I joined a team of people at TrickleUp.org, a nonprofit, and also another organization called Accion, A-C-C-I-O-N, and we started to do it right here in New York City. Many people said it could not be done. People said, well, it's great for the developing world, but we can't make it work here. And it turns out that mentorship was the key to making this a success. So we went into communities in Harlem, in Washington Heights, in Brooklyn, in the Bronx, and I was very used to being an entrepreneur. I've been a serial entrepreneur really all my life since I was in high school starting companies. Uh, you all here are entrepreneurial. You're part of a great startup and uh, I'm sure have started companies on your own and part of a great startup that you guys have, have built together here as a culture. And so we went in, we identified lots of people who had entrepreneurial ideas. There are literally hundreds of thousands of people in New York City that have the dream of becoming an entrepreneur, yet are outside the traditional banking and capital system. These are individuals, there's about a third of the city, about a third of the city cannot go to a bank and get a loan. About a third of the city cannot go up into Capital One or TD Bank or Citibank and say, hey, here's my credit history, I need a loan, five, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. Not even talking about half a million dollars, just ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 because I want to start a food catering business. I want to start a daycare center. I want to start a new clothing design company or fashion accessory or watch company. I need that ten, twenty thousand dollars to to get going. About a third of the city can't do that. And so Acción and Trickle Up go in, identify the individuals, often via partnerships in the local communities, and help them develop their business plan. The next second thing that is most important is the mentor. And so folks like myself, yourselves, if you want to join in on this, can be mentors to the low-income individuals for their entrepreneurial venture. And so we come in once a week, twice a week, once a month, whatever the arrangement is, to help that entrepreneur and nurture that startup with mentorship, with our lessons learned from and mistakes that I've made, mistakes that others have made in terms of building companies, and help them through the process. In America, the average small business, how many fail, how much percentage fail in America right now? 60% fail. 60% of small businesses fail in their first year. In our program, only 20% fail. And the key differential was mentorship. The key differential was mentorship. And again, these are individuals with no credit history, no MBAs, no traditional education in terms of building businesses. Uh, and this is something that we found succeeded. In the course of five years, we started 2,500 new small businesses right in New York City. 2,500. I'll give you an example. Daycare. Daycare is a huge need across New York City. And we found that in buildings, let's say uh, in public housing and other buildings with low and middle income uh, housing, there was a huge need for daycare. So we found individuals that wanted to do daycare in their apartment. And it's, you can be licensed by the city to have up to six kids, seven kids in your apartment, take care of them. We set up the apartment. We gave a loan of $5,000 to set it all up, get the marketing going. And sure enough, within six months, it was profitable because they would take care of one or two of their own kids and the other moms in the building would drop their kids off and be able to go to work. So it had a twofer in terms of upside. Those moms got to go to work and this mom got to have a business. 
Now, what percentage do you think of all the low-income entrepreneurs that we helped, 2,500, were women? Any guesses? What percentage were women? So I'll just give you a stat. In Silicon Alley and Silicon Valley, fewer than 10% of startups are started or founded or led by women, fewer than 10%. In this group of 2,500, 85%, 85% women. And so that's what we found overseas, and that's what we found right here in New York City. There's a tremendous amount of potential that we need to unleash in New York City of people who want to be entrepreneurial, people across all communities, people across all five boroughs. And part of why I'm running as mayor is to unleash this entrepreneurial opportunity, to unleash the entrepreneurial spirit that is now inside all of our communities. The past three, four months, what have I done? I've gone around to almost every single community. I've spoken in mosques, I've spoken in community centers, I've spoken in Latino communities, Jewish communities, black communities, all kinds of communities around, around town. And one common theme, people who come to the city, 37% of our city are folks not born in the US. The majority of the city are folks who come to, to New York not having been born here. And people want to come to New York and realize the American dream. Mentorship is critical in, in Trickle Up, in these kinds of programs, and has been able to demonstrate the ability to unleash this entrepreneurial opportunity. So partly why I'm running is I want to unleash this opportunity, not just in Manhattan, not just in Silicon Alley, not just for tech companies, but for all kinds of companies out there. Food-based businesses, daycare centers, um, healthcare companies, high tech in terms of healthcare, merging with digital in terms of the digitized self, quantified self as well. These are all opportunities for New York City. So we have a huge opportunity, and I think someone like myself with my background as an entrepreneur can really help realize that potential. Let me talk about a second mentorship. So as Charlie mentioned, I've been very involved in education the last six, seven years. And we asked the following question. We asked, why do some schools succeed tremendously and others don't? Are there any common themes that we can find among the schools around the United States that are succeeding in a big way? And you might say, well, intuitively I might say, well, maybe it's because some schools have lots of money, big endowments. They're private schools, very well endowed. They have lots of lab space and things like that. Other schools are public schools. They don't have that, those capabilities. It turns out that's not the case. It turns out one of the key determinants of success in education across the country, we did a listening tour with the Gates Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, other NIH, NSF, we went around the country to find what are some of the best schools out there. Top five school in the country, top five school in the country rated in the past seven years, often number one in, that, uh, in, in high schools across the country, is TJ, Thomas Jefferson High School. Anybody here ever heard of TJ? So, TJ is a school where you do not find 30 kids lined up listening to lectures five, six hours a day. It's a high school where kids work in small teams, solving problems, overcoming challenges, and driving to a goal together. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, it's like this company, right? You guys work in teams, you solve problems, you work each other, you help each other, and get, get the job done. That's what TJ is about. And TJ regularly produces the top graduates in our country. So a TJ group got together during school, not an after-school program, during school and decided to build a satellite, a satellite that goes to space. They built it, NASA took a look at it, they launched it in space. It's in space right now, helping us with our weather right now. This is what a bunch of high school kids did. And so um, right back here in New York City, there's a school called Eastside Community. Eastside Community is a public school. It's not a charter school, it's a straight on public school. And in this school, as you heard, kids from sixth grade on build a portfolio of work. Every three months, they build a portfolio of work in math and science, projects they do with their, uh, their peers and their teachers and other outside adults. And then every three months, they present that. They present that information, that portfolio of work, to a group of adults like ourselves. You could volunteer anytime if you want to. You can come down to one of these sessions, and you become like an American Idol panel where you get to hear their presentation and give them constructive feedback. One of the kids I mentored is Cody Medina. Cody Medina was a sophomore in high school at Eastside when I first met him. Very shy, very introverted, wasn't presenting a lot. Uh, he had not joined from sixth grade, he had just joined from ninth grade on. And he was just trying to understand the system that they had at Eastside. Um, I was able to take him on a lot of different experiences related to TED, the conference, and other experiences as his mentor. Uh, other kids had other mentors as well. And sure enough, he really blossomed into a kid who presents, engages, understands feedback, works in teams, and today he's a very successful college student and a sophomore in college right now.
So again, mentorship was absolutely critical, bringing mentorship into the schools from the adult world, from the real world, into the school was so critical in changing that, that kind of approach. So those are just two examples there. We need to transform our industry in New York City because the growth opportunities are companies like this. That's where the jobs are coming from. The jobs are coming from companies like, like this one, companies that will spin out of Cornell Technion, companies that will spin out of all the incubators. And it's great that you see so many co-working spaces in Silicon Alley. But how about in Coney Island, where I grew up? I grew up in Ocean Parkway near Coney Island. There's no co-working spaces there. There's no shared workspaces there. There's no business incubators there. There's no angel funds there. And there's very little even in terms of microenterprise there. I want to make sure that all communities around New York City have the opportunity to engage in entrepreneurial talent and entrepreneurial spirit. Second, skills upgrade. Not everybody wants to start a company. That's OK. That's fine. But many people want to plug into the growth economy. Have people heard of General Assembly? General Assembly is a great organization on Broadway and 20th Street that has intense skill workshops, six to 12 weeks, that get you from no knowledge of a computer at all to being a web developer, being an IT manager, being an assistance person, being a PC tech, all kinds of different jobs. And sure enough, those jobs are out there. In fact, in their 12-week program, they guarantee you a slot at a leading company in New York City. And they've been able to fulfill that guarantee now for more than 7,000 people. More than 7,000 people have gone through that program and have slots and have jobs right now with an average starting salary of $70,000. These are folks who, 12 weeks before that, could not literally look at a piece of code and tell you what, anything about that. And so it's been a very successful program. That's the good news. Bad news. It's only at Broadway and 20th Street. And so when you're in the Bronx, when you're in Queens, and you're taking care of two kids, and you have a family, and you have responsibilities, you're not able to plug in to those kinds of opportunities. As mayor, I want to make sure that we have a wider net, that we can offer these kinds of opportunities. I spoke to GA. They're up for the challenge. They want to bring their workshops out to the boroughs, out to the edges. Let's have a distributed system so that we can have centers of excellence all around New York City, not just in one place. And so that's one of my visions for New York City. We need to unleash the entrepreneurial spirit that we have, but across all sectors and all communities across New York, and second, in terms of education, transform our K through 12 from one of 18th century memorization and testing to one of team-based work, collaboration, mentorship, the kind of stuff that you see at TJ, the kind of stuff that you see at Eastside, the kind of things that we now know work. We, the best of the best are, are approaching things in this way. What we want to do with our K through 12 system is really open it up to, for these kinds of innovations to spread across the system. But also, not just K through 12, adult learning as well. Each one of us sitting in this room right now and on a uh, video conference can always enhance our skills, right? You guys have a saying here, better me, better you, better us. And so we always want to better ourselves. We want to make sure that we're always advancing. I take online courses at various MOOCs. I'm taking a course right now with Eric Lander about genetics. He's a professor at, up at MIT around genetics. And so I'm always taking courses myself. Everyone here, I'm sure, is trying to better yourselves in, in different ways. Let's make sure that we all have those opportunities in New York City, that everyone has the opportunity to better themselves through more skills, through engaging, through entrepreneurship, and through mentorship as well. Thank you very much. So let me just take, say one or two words about the race itself and then open up to Q&A. Last night was the primary. And um, uh, as you heard, we had to wait till the primary happened to figure out who I'm running against. We now sort of know who I'm running against. Um, most probably Bill de Blasio uh, on the D side and uh, Joe Loda on the R side. Uh, I'm somebody who worked for President Obama in the first campaign and, and his other efforts uh, in terms of helping get elected. But I chose to run as independent because I really wanted to be independent of the special interests. I really want to focus on being mayor for everyone in New York City and not having to kowtow to all kinds of special interests. Uh, so that's why I ran in this way. We put in 37,000 signatures. Those were accepted. So I have a guaranteed slot on November 5th. And so I'm on the ballot November 5th in all five boroughs. You'll see me in all the different polling places on November 5th. And now our goal is to get the word out through organizations such as this, through sharing of word of mouth, Twitter, all kinds of different ways of getting the word out to make sure that people know about us so that on November 5th, there'll be a clear choice. Either go with a machine politician, people who have been part of uh, lots of different administrations who've had chances to make big change but did not make big change, who've had chances to voice the kind of things I just discussed today but have not because they come from a different background. 
These are not entrepreneurs. These are not folks who build companies. These aren't folks who are plugged into where the growth of the economy is. These aren't folks who are plugged into how education needs to transform. And so that'll be the clear choice. Machine politics going back to the 70s and 80s or a clear choice to move forward in the future. And that's the choice we're going to present in New York City on November 5th. So the goal in the next seven, eight weeks is to really make that choice visible. We're going to do that via guerrilla campaigns, TV ads, print, online. We have a great online targeting capability. We have cookies in the browser of every single voter out there. So we're going to be reaching you. If you happen to be online, see one of my ads, you'll know why. Um, <laughs> and uh, we have a lot of great, uh, uh, very, very punchy, snappy ads that will go out live uh, on TV starting in the next few weeks. So look for us out there as well. But with that, let me open up to Q&A and see what questions people might have about the race or about myself or about the issues or anything you want to talk about, please. Hey, Greg, do you want to start in Boston? Uh, sure. I have, a, I have a bunch of questions, but maybe I'll just uh, start with one or two, and then if we have time, we'll come back. The, uh, so one question here was around, uh, you touched on two parts uh, of kind of mentorship. And you know, one of the things, it, it's, a, it's a common topic here. It, it's a big part of our culture here. Um, and, and one of the things, that, you know, it's very difficult to build successful mentorship programs. So, I'm curious from, from your standpoint, uh, you get some totally impressive stats of, of and, and you've teed on it, like what guidance do you give for both mentors in terms of uh, what works and what doesn't work as being a, a, a successful mentor, but then also you know, any advice you have or, or kind of recommendations for being a mentee of how to be a more successful mentee? Yeah, uh, great question. Well, just as you guys have found out here at, at Next Jump, you know, the mentor-mentee relationship, to be successful, both parties have to give something uh, into, the, into the relationship. And what I found in terms of mentoring uh, entrepreneurs, and I mentor a lot of, you know, traditional entrepreneurs as well, people in Silicon Alley, people starting companies with seed rounds and tech companies and things like that, and I mentor many of those too. But particularly in mentoring micro-enterprise entrepreneurs, and I encourage everyone here to really try that out. Uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating experience. It's a different kind of experience. You're going to gain a lot from mentoring as well because you're going to see new ways of thinking about entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship that you're not used to, entrepreneurship that doesn't start with, hey, let's create an app and let's send it out there or let's create a piece of code and, and um, iterate quickly and things like that. Uh, these are different kinds of businesses than you may be used to. So you're going to learn a lot about what it means to have a uh, a retail store that sells clothing, or a daycare center, or a food-related business, or these kinds of areas. And so it's a very interesting learning process to say, how do I take my skills and my knowledge and my experience of fast iteration, of fast fail, of, of you know, checking things and beta product and, and, and other kind of tools that we use in our sector, and how do we apply it and should we apply it to other sectors? So as a mentor, you really want to be open to that kind of learning as well. Uh, what I found in terms of the Trickle Up program is that the mentors who came with a very open mind were very successful, and we trained the mentors to, to try to do that. So I would say that's, that's one of the key things, really. It's just really focusing in on what the mentor can get out of it as well. The same thing in the schools. Um, if you ask the people who mentor at Eastside Community who come in for these American Idol kind of panels, um, they love it. I mean, it's wonderful to get this kind of presentation from a, a sixth grader, 10th grader, 12th grader, and hear their presentations. By the way, the work they're doing, I really encourage everyone to go check out these schools. It's nothing like most of us ever did in school. Um, I'll give an example in math. Uh, math for most of us, uh, I know there's many engineers here, so many people are really good at math, uh, but math for most everyone is a textbook. You study the chapter, you do the problems at the end of the chapter, pretty much cut and dry. Um, and some people enjoy that, many people kind of just, you know, drudge through it. Well, math at Eastside is not about that. Um, first of all, they bring art in. And so they'll make all kinds of geometric shapes and things like that using art and creativity. Uh, second, they write prose. They actually write essays about math. Okay, so their English teacher and their math teacher collaborate together in the same classroom to actually write prose essays on mathematical topics. Um, these are kids at, at such a different level um, in, in terms of their thinking about math than you can, you can imagine. I should mention that 100% of the kids at Eastside come from public housing. 100% are in government assistance. This is not a school that has uh, a testing to get in, it's a magnet school, things like that. It's nothing of the sort. And so um, th we demonstrated that kids who are not coming from privileged backgrounds are thriving in this kind of environment because they're offered the opportunity to really express their creativity uh, and their, their curiosity. So those are, I think, some of the, the lessons I would say on, on mentorship. Thank you for the question. 
Hey, Kevin, you want to ask from the UK? Sorry, he's not on the camera, but okay. he's on the phone. There he is. Kevin, Kevin you there? is now in silent mode. All participants are muted. Press R1 to mute your line. Participant lines muted. What are you trying to speak? Participant lines unmuted. Hey, Kevin, are you there? Yeah, sorry, Charlie. We're on now. We're muted. Okay, go ahead. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for the talk, chat. My question is around, you know, you mentioned unleashing the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, as an entrepreneur yourself, I, I'm really keen to understand the, the big learnings and, I guess, the mistakes you've made as an entrepreneur and the, and the advice you give to aspiring entrepreneurs as well. Wow. Well, that's a, probably subject of another talk altogether. But um, did anyone hear the questions? Questions about um, mistakes I've made. Uh, so we probably need four or five hours uh, for that to summarize that. Um, well, one, I would say that um, you know when I've started diff different operations or different offices of my companies in different places, uh, if there was not the focus on culture, uh, then we probably didn't have the success that we wanted to. And I would say that I probably never achieved some of the cultural. Uh, success that you guys have here. I think there's been more an understanding than we had, say, 10 plus years ago when we first started a lot of the companies in Silicon Alley um, around the importance of culture. I think we knew it was important, and we, we devoted some resources and some of the kind of programs you see here right now to that. But you look at this company, I just spent a lot of time with Tony Shea at Zappos in Las Vegas. Uh, and Tony's another individual who really focuses on culture in a big way. And there's lots of companies now that you can see examples. Uh, you guys have obviously taken it to the next level with all kinds of experimentation and iteration in terms of your cultural programs that are really paying off in, in a big way. So I would say that you know, early on in my career, I probably didn't focus enough on those kinds of areas. We focus more on, you know, just shipping the product out and engaging with customers, and those are, you know, important things. But we probably didn't focus enough uh, on culture. So I would say that's one of the things that I've that I've learned. Uh, also, I would say that, uh, you know, framing to me is very, very important. Um, I'll give you an example. Let's look at the arts in New York City. A lot of people say the arts are great. I love art. I love the Broadway shows. I love drama. I love theater. I love the museums. It's great that it's here. How much should New York spend on that? Well, it's certainly not as important, you'd say, as the trains running on time and safety and crime and, you know, so many other issues. Arts are nice to have, but not, not as critical. Now, that's one framing that you can have about arts. I would actually suggest a different framing. I would say that arts in New York City are absolutely critical. One, because you can see it in the frame of economic development. When you look at almost every neighborhood in New York City that has had a revival, uh, when you look at, I mean, you know, I grew up in Brooklyn, in South Brooklyn, in the unhit part of Brooklyn. We have no artisanal cheese factories. We have no chocolate factories in Coney Island. Um, not yet, anyway. And uh, you look at the parts of Brooklyn now that have really, you know, come up in a big way, uh, you see that arts really were the leading edge. That was the leading arrow that actually came into those neighborhoods first. It was artists, it was art programs, it was different extension programs of MoMA or other things like that, open studios that really helped revive those neighborhoods. So when you see art as economic development, suddenly you say, wait a second, no, no, I don't want to spend just $100 million on this. I want to spend $300 million on this because, or $400 million or $500 million because this is something that actually achieves economic development. It also achieves economic development from the point of attracting tourism. 2003, we had 30 million tourists in New York City visiting us you know, every year. This past year, 52 million, million tourists visit us. I will have a plan that takes us to 65 million tourists. And key to that plan is to continue to invest in the arts. We have to make sure we attract people, not just the Broadway shows on 42nd Street. Uh, I met recently with the Small Theaters Group. This is a group of about 100 small theaters across New York City, theaters that are even smaller sometimes than this room. And so these are theaters that we now need to introduce to our tourist population, tell people about. People are always coming to New York City. They want to find the next thing. They want to now venture into Queens and find a fantastic new eatery, a new restaurant. Queens, for example, is such a gem of a place. More than 160 languages spoken just in one borough. So much ethnic diversity, so much ethnic diversity in terms of restaurants and places. Let's open that up for tourists to go and enjoy. 
right now you have to kind of be a pioneer to go into some of these areas because it's not as easy to go as a tourist to some of these locations. Let's open up hospitality. Let's open up some hotels. If you want to stay in Brooklyn overnight in a hotel, it's actually, that, it's actually pretty difficult. It's actually not that many hotels to stay in. Let's open up and let's offer people the ability to stay at Coney Island and enjoy Coney Island as an example. So the kind of things I'm talking about in terms of arts are framing it a little differently. And I think that's one of the lessons I've learned over time in entrepreneurship. When you look at a problem, you look at a product, you look at a solution, maybe frame it in a different way so that you can attack it from another angle. Thanks for the question. Question in New York? Mike? Hey, um, thanks for the talk, but I have a question. How do you plan to attract sort of cap, like, top talent into education? Because it seems to be like a lot of people come out of these great universities and they want to jump into these like, high paid tech jobs and they have this idea of like, that's really attractive. But it's yeah. hard to get people with advanced degrees to sort of teach into like underprivileged areas of the city. Yeah. Unless it's some sort of like Teach for America program. And so, like, teaching as a whole sort of has this sort of stigma. My sister was teaching college and like my parents were like, why do you want to be a teacher? Like, right. have all this education. So like, how do you plan to attract people who have the ability of the tools to sort of empower and enrich their social lives and still feel that, you know, it's hard to sort of provide yeah. for That's a great question. Can you repeat the question? Because I think yeah. So, so great question about uh, how do we attract top talent to become teachers? Um, there's you know such a uh, top talent often wants to go and be, you know get jobs right here at Next Jump, get jobs at uh, Google, NYC, and other places, and those are great jobs as well. How do we attract top talent uh, uh, here into into education? Well, first, let's also um, define more of a continuum of who teachers are. Right? So as I mentioned before, yes, we have teachers who are full-time teachers who need to be in the schools full-time, and I'll address that in one second. But let's also talk about people like ourselves, who are top talent and can now come into the schools at Eastside and places like that and actually form a key backbone to education. So I really want to actually highlight that right now, which is that we don't have to have just one thing called a teacher full-time or not a teacher, right, binary, black or white. We can actually now have a continuum of people who are involved in educating the next generation and educating them in the schools and educating through all kinds of programs that we have around the city. A friend of mine, Glenn Whitney, just started MoMath, the Museum of Math. Has anyone been to the Museum of Math yet? Okay, it's really, really cool. What, do you, have you been there? Yeah. <laughs> um, there should be, I think, a point system, not just for Jim, but also going to MoMath um, and visiting MoMath and a point uh, gamification system for people to help out at MoMath. Um, so Museum of Math is a hands-on interactive place just a few blocks away. Glenn had that vision. Uh, and he's a teacher. He's somebody now who's teaching probably, I would have to guess, 500 to 1,000 kids a week you know, are coming through that through MoMath, and it's a two-floor museum, it's very hands-on, it's very interactive, and so he's a teacher, right? He's a teacher in a different way, but, uh, but he's a teacher, and all the people who work there are teachers as well, and they have math teachers, and they have other kinds of teachers on site who used to be, say, public school uh, math teachers working with the kids there, but working in a very different way. So let's broaden our perspective in terms of, you know, how each of us can become teachers. Second, in terms of the full-time teachers, 75,000 teachers in, in New York City, for our 1.1 million kids in, in school. Uh, how do we attract more top talent there? Well, first, I think it has to start with the approach we have in the schools. Number one, we have to give more autonomy to the principals and teachers in each school and make sure they have the empowerment to choose the approach that is best for their particular set of students. Um, we started with that process around 2004, 2005. There was a breakup so that you can actually have autonomous school zones across New York City. In the past two years, however, things have kind of reverted back a little more to command and control. And so a lot of people are not as excited to join that system. I think we have to really get back to autonomy and open, and openness in terms of choice of the principals. I'll give you an example. Uh, Donna Taylor is a principal of the School of Inquiry at Avenue P in Stillwell in Brooklyn. And it's a public school. And it's a school where she decided to opt out. She opted out of the school curriculum offered by the central office. And she, with her teaching base, her teaching staff, developed their own curriculum. They're held to the same standards as the rest of the, rest of the schools in the city, but they decided to create their own pathway towards those standards. We want to encourage more principals to opt out, more teachers to join with their principals and say, we're going to craft something special for our kids here. Now, yes, we'll be held to a high standard, and we have to offer that data back. So it'll still be data-driven, but let's, let's make sure that happens. So the number one thing that attracts top talent 
to this, com- to this company or others is when they, people say, I will have the power to have some choice about my career, about how I interact with students. If they feel they're just going to be a cog in the, in the big system, you're, not, you're never going to attract top talent. It pay, not pay, high pay, low pay, right? Here in this company, um, you know, there was a number of years where you probably had issues around you know, recruiting and retaining you know, top talent. And it wasn't saying, oh, we're going to triple the pay of everybody. That's going to keep people here, right? It was, it was more so thinking about culture, thinking about empowerment, thinking about those kinds of things. So again, more pay is good, and we want to make sure that our teachers are as best paid as possible, and that's a positive thing. But that's not actually going to attract all the kind of top talent that, that you're referring to. So I think those are some of the keys to making sure we can attract the top talent. I can tell you that Eastside Community, just as one example, you have top talent in that school, and they're attracted by this approach of interacting and engaging with kids in a totally different way. Thank you. Please. What's your name? Um, Ella. Um, what, how is running for mayor part of your your why, your purpose? Like, I, yeah. I mean, clearly this is a huge risk to you because it's going to cost you a lot of money to yeah. campaign and put a huge debt in your, I don't know, net worth, et cetera. Uh, so how is this connected to uh, why you're doing this? Sure. Um, to me, really, is the logical next step. Uh, you know, I'm somebody who is, is native to the city, loves the city, and has always been very involved, you know, not only in my companies and building out companies and making jobs that way, but always had the sense, I mean, my, I model myself after my father, my mother, and the people around me. Um, my grandfather, who came to this country, many of us here come from immigrant communities and families, um, is somebody who really had nothing, literally were peddlers on the street, and my, my great-grandfather was a barber with no barber shop, just in his house, cutting people's hair. I mean, so, you know, like many people here had very humble beginnings in our family. But always, no matter what they had or didn't have, were always giving back. These are people who were involved in education, involved in community centers, involved in all kinds of charitable giving, anonymous loans. In fact, before the word microenterprise was even coined, my grandfather, Jack Hittery, was giving secret loans to people in his community, in our community where we grew up in Brooklyn, uh, to people who came to him in secret and said, I have an issue, I need a thousand bucks, whatever it is. He was not a wealthy guy, but he would just scrape it together and he would give them uh, these loans. Um, so. Those are the models I had growing up. And so for me, it was very natural to get involved in microfinance, get involved in education, get involved in building out community centers. One of my visions for New York and what I'll do as mayor is build out 30 community centers across New York City. Uh, I was blessed to have a community center near me, a place where families can come together, a place where kids can come after school, a a place you can get mentorship for your small business, uh, a nurse in that community center where you can get basic health care for your kids and for yourself, where you don't have access to other kinds of health care. There are about 30 spots in New York City right off the bat that we identified that are community center um, deserts. They don't have a community center. They don't have a place they can come to and, and mentor and men- have mentees as well. And so these are the kinds of things that, you know, that where I come from, those are the things that are important to me. You don't hear that from other candidates out there, even from the candidates now that are gone and the current candidates. You don't hear them talking about, let's invest in community centers. That's not something that people running for mayor talk about. I'm talking about it because it's a critical factor to me, because I was enmeshed and built and grew up in this very, very um, strong community, uh, centered you know, right near Coney Island, people who said, we may not have much, but we have each other. And so let's really, really focus on that. So for me, it's just a natural extension to say, now let me, now that I've worked and toiled in all these areas, in microfinance, in education, in entrepreneurship, um, in, in, in all kinds of areas, both here in this country and elsewhere, let me now take it to scale. Right? All of us in our companies, we want to make sure that we can scale our ideas and scale our products uh, as we build them. And so this is the natural next step for scale. If I want to have the kind of impact that I envision having on our school system, I've got to be mayor to do that. Uh, if I want to have the impact in terms of entrepreneurship in our city, not just for folks in Silicon Alley, not just for folks who went to you know, the best schools, but people who went to any school out there, whatever educational background, to help them start their company and unleash that kind of economic expansion, I have to be mayor to do that. So that's why I'm running for mayor. Thank you. Any more questions, New York? Uh, you touched on the importance of women in business. Yeah. I was just curious, like, what's your plan to continue to encourage Sure. Uh, the question was about women in business. I talked about the importance of women, encouraging women in business. Um, what is my plan to actually you know, move forward on that and um, make that happen as, as mayor? Is that? Okay. Well, 
Uh, first of all, it actually starts also back in, into K through 12 education. Uh, one of my visions is to bring in NIFTY and other programs into our schools. NIFTY is National Foundation for Teaching Entrepreneurship, NFTE, NIFTY. Uh, and NIFTY helps kids starting in the sixth grade create their own business plans uh, and create real businesses, not just mock businesses, but actual businesses that take in money, sell things, and have you know, revenues and income and expense. Um, Nifty is a wonderful program. Uh, Amy Rosen runs it, uh, and I encourage you all to check that out. But this is one of the kind of programs that would give kids the kind of experience uh, from a very early age. Uh, and it would also uh, bring both girls and boys into the idea of entrepreneurship and into business from a very early age. Again, I was lucky and fortunate that we had a lot of small businesses around me growing up, and I could see that as models. Many people don't have that. So that's, that's first. Got to start with education there. Uh, second. We want to make sure that in all of our communities, we're really um, uh, empowering women in different ways. And so, uh, as I mentioned, in a lot of, for example, Latino communities. My mom is from Colombia, South America, and so I spent a lot of time in Latino communities. Uh, I speak actual Spanish, not Bloomberg Spanish. Um, and and um, in Latino communities, you find that Latinos come to this country very often wanting to start a business, wanting to develop a business, wanting to grow a business. Uh, and Latino women, Latina women in general, often have that, that to desire to do that as well. We want to encourage that. We want to go in with these microfinance uh, opportunities and programs and make sure we encourage that uh, to make that happen. We also want to make sure that in the growth areas, for example, in high tech, uh, right now in biology, if you look at PhDs in biology, we now finally have parity. So there's equal number of women and men getting PhDs in biology across the country. But in physics and math, uh, and engineering, they were still out of parity. Uh, I've spent a lot of my time on STEM, on science, tech, engineering, and math, and particularly in a partnership with Google on focusing on how do we get more women into STEM. We still have a major issue, a major hurdle in doing that. In terms of startups in Silicon Alley and Silicon Valley, I did some analysis uh, with Cindy Podnos. She's a VC out of uh, the West Coast, Illuminate VC. She's a, a, a woman and a woman-focused VC as well. And there's also another VC firm here that I work with called Starvest in New York City that is a, a, a woman-focused VC. And together we've done some analysis, and again, that's where the stats come from, that fewer than 10% of our uh, entrepreneurs in New York City and Silicon Valley are women-led businesses. So we need to really broaden that out. We need to make sure that we have special programs um, that uh, encourage more women to come in. One of the top programs I encourage is Women in Enterprise, WIE, WE. If you go to WeNetwork.org, it's started by uh, two great, great female entrepreneurs. Um, they have the backing of Donna Karen, Ariana Huffington, great female um, you know, mega entrepreneurs. And uh, WE is something that is an encouraging, positive network that brings women together and says, we can do it, we can make these companies happen, we can start our own companies, and, and they encourage that, and it forms the kind of a bonding network and a mentorship network where they have every one of the Donna Karens of the world mentor a young woman who wants to start a company. So I wanna make sure we encourage and invest in those kinds of areas. So those are the few things that we'll do, but there's a lot to be done in terms of those areas. Thank yeah. you. For the next question, we're just passing around a side sheet. You don't have to sign, uh, just if you wanna keep in the loop and stay in touch with us. Yeah. And let me just mention that Daniel, um, Amy, Shauna of my team here, if you have questions after also, you, any one of them can help you as well. Please sign up for our newsletter right here. Greg, I'm going to throw it back to Greg for a second, Boston. Yes, I know you had a bunch, Greg, too. Yeah, the, uh, the show, the, uh, maybe touch on this a little bit, but a question here was, uh, you know, who, who's... Uh, uh, in some ways, kind of been your inspired mentor, kind of helped you most, maybe you know, from childhood to today, uh, that's contributed to you know where you are, where you are now. Um, I would have to say it's my dad. Um, my dad is somebody who um, has been, besides being a, a small business guy. Uh, always been involved in education. He was president of our local school for 20 years. My earliest memories go back to our own uh, house where basically I spent most of my childhood bringing folding chairs up from the basement, setting up folding chairs for meetings that my dad was having for education for all the people coming over. And so I spent most of my life as a waiter serving uh, different people coming over in all these meetings, uh, drinks and uh, food and stuff like that. And that was a great experience to kind of see what was happening in these late night meetings as to how they're going to help this nonprofit school survive. There was, it was always a calamity. It was always at the edge of disaster. There was always just one paycheck left before all the school 
school, you know, would shut down. Um, and so I learned a lot just growing up around that experience. Uh, and to see my dad, and my dad is somebody, if you met him, he's a very humble guy, uh, not somebody who um, gives a lot of speeches, though now he's gotten really good at it uh, later in life. Uh, but somebody who is very quiet, very humble, you wouldn't know from just meeting him that he's done all these things and helping people. And so it's been a, a great inspiration to me to see somebody who's both taking care of his own family, but also out there day in, day out, helping, helping others as well. There's also many people that he helped, again, you know, anonymously, people who came in from other countries who had hardship in this country, and he helped out in different ways. And just, again, just somebody who really was always thinking about other people, but did it naturally. It wasn't something that you knew about him if you didn't really delve into it. Kevin, something in the UK? Hey, Kevin? We're okay, Charles. Okay. Questions in New York? I know New York has the most, so. Please. Uh, so, uh, I love the What's emphasis. What's your name? I'm John. Uh, I love the emphasis on creating companies in New York City. Um, one of the biggest problems I see is that New York just has terrible company formation and tax laws. Like, so I formed a couple LLCs. The first was in New York, and then naturally the second was in Delaware, yeah. like everyone else. I mean, Connections formed in Delaware as well. Yeah. Is there anything we can do about these laws, or, you know, like, what's, what's the strategy around that type of stuff? Yeah. Um, you know, there's some things we can do and I can do as mayor, but there's a lot of stuff I can do because there's a lot of the state yeah. stuff. Um, uh, you know, and so, you know, Delaware is a natural place for a lot of people to form LLCs, and there's places like the company corporation and places like that that make it very easy to form these remote LLCs now. I also, but I think we also have to, for New York City, you know, many of the companies that people, uh, say, in this room might create are digital or tech or, you know, companies that don't necessarily need physical space. Uh, but there are many companies in New York City that need physical space, such as retail companies, restaurants, bodegas, you know, uh, grocery stores. And those companies, I can tell you right now, have huge hurdles in New York City. And that is something that the mayor can really help with. Um, and right now, there's a lot of a thicket of, of, of rules and regulations and often a lot of fines that come in. And so the city has kind of used um, our retail industry as an ATM machine for the past four or five years, because as we've had this financial crisis, needed to plug the budget hole, um, basically about three, four hundred million dollars of fines have been extracted from really kind of low to middle income individuals who started many of these retail businesses uh, who have a fine because, you know, this little thing is out of place or that thing's out of place. No warning. They just come in, give you $2,000 fine, and they're out of there. And so uh, I really think we need to think about other ways of bringing revenue into the city besides using our bodegas as ATM machines uh, for the city. Uh, not the little ATM machine, but, you know, the whole thing as an ATM machine. And so um, my vision is to really be not only the mayor who's running the city, but also the mayor who's a chief attractor of capital and jobs into the city. Um, I serve on the board of Google Labs. Uh, that's the part of Google with Google Glasses and self-driving cars. And so, yes, everybody will get Google Glasses uh, when I'm mayor. All, <laughs> all 8 million citizens will get Google Glasses. It's very exciting. Um, but, but in seriousness, uh, Google came to New York and opened up uh, its Chelsea offices and spent $2 billion you know, to buy that building, invest in that building, uh, invest in culture, doing some of the things that you guys do here, making sure they have a strong, it's not just like an outpost. I mean, it's very much a New York cultural spot for, for Google with 3,000 jobs. Uh, and, and one of the reasons why they did that is because they wanted to tap into our great markets here, our advertising market, our engineering talent. They want to make sure they do that. Well, I'm uniquely positioned, I think it's clear now, among all the, the three candidates now, to go out to Silicon Valley, convince more companies out there to say, open up some new offices in New York City. I don't have to say to Mountain View companies, move your whole company here. So if they want to, that's fine. But open up your offices in New York City. I can go to Israel, where I've done a lot of work, and convince many of the tech companies there. People know about all the high tech in Israel. You know what? Don't keep skipping over us in a plane and going right to Palo Alto. Land here from Israel, which is closer, and open up your American offices here in Israel. And so I want to create 400,000 new jobs in New York City. Uh, jobs for all of our friends and other people that we know, and people, again, from all five boroughs who want to train into this area, 400,000 jobs in our extended uh, areas of sectors for New York City, and do so by attracting those jobs from outside in. So yes, I want to see organic growth of companies like this. You guys have, what, about 200 you know, people now. Hopefully, you'll, you'll even grow further, um, but that, and that's great. So organic growth is absolutely critical, but let's also attract jobs from the outside in. And so attracting capital is critical to the growth of any economy. 
We are a $530 billion city economy. We're the largest city economy in the world. And when you look at Brazil, look at China, look at any economy that's growing at a fast rate, what are three letters that are determinant in those kinds of growth, growth rates? FDI, foreign direct investment. Those economies are able to attract capital and jobs from outside in. They're able to convince America, you know, U.S. investors, as an example, to go to Sao Paulo, to invest in infrastructure projects, invest in the next, you know, power projects and things like that. We need to do the same thing here. Just as the President of the United States goes overseas and says, hey, um, you know, country X, we need you to buy more Boeing aircraft. I, as the mayor, will go around the world and say, open up your offices here, open up job opportunities here. So that's really how I want to grow New York City, not by essentially taxing our small businesses by using them as a little ATM machine and extracting little fines from them all the time. So that's what you can see from the Hillary administration. Question here? More? Please. Um, you seem to have grown up with a strong guidance and engagement in your family, especially involved in the community. Um, I, I see a big problem where people can work long hours, they can't get involved, they can't be involved in any type of policy that affects their community or themselves as individuals. How can you encourage people with busy schedules and not a lot of time left in the day to really get involved on not not maybe not mentorship things, but things in their community that to that affects the policies that are going to be uh, put forth for their community, like the yeah. measures inside there at the end of the day. Yeah. Are you saying you work, you work long hours? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> um, so the question is, just to repeat the question, the question is a great question about, um, you know, it's, it's wonderful that, that uh, I grew up in a community very civically engaged and others want to be civically engaged, but the reality is many people in New York are working long hours, very, very busy. How can we encourage, what are the pathways for them to become civically engaged if they don't have the time to come to East Side? Uh, although, again, let me just mention, it's only once every three months. You can just do it <laughs> once if you want, and it's just like for two hours. So anyway, maybe there'll be a new opportunity, a new cultural opportunity here and next jump. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to gamify the whole system. You get a point of every citizen in New York City. No. Um, well, I, I would say a couple things. There are a lot of ways to be civically involved in New York City and, and not have to really take a lot of time out. Um, first of all, there are just one, one-time opportunities, and you can find that New York Cares. Uh, NYCares.org is a great organization that I've supported, that I've, I've done a GED tutoring. I once did a GED tutoring uh, via New York Cares, and uh, I was tutoring um, a, a woman uh, who was, um, came into this country, was really getting her, bootstrapping herself up, getting her GED, and I was going through geography with her, and I explained to her that the Earth uh, is not you know, fixed. It's actually, you know, rotating and revolving at the same time. Uh, she was about, uh, let's see, 24, 25 uh, years old, getting her GED. And uh, she, this was the first time she'd ever heard anyone tell her that the earth is rotating and revolving. She literally got dizzy and she fell off her chair because she, she actually lost spatial, you know, sense of what's happening and she fell off her chair. So it was a big wake up call to me that, you know, we need to be engaged in these kinds of programs to share the knowledge that we have, to share what we have. So NY Cares is great because you can say, you know what, I don't have time during the year. But on Thanksgiving and on Christmas Day, say two days of the year when we have off, I want to give back on those two days. A lot of my friends use holidays as a give back day, and that's something I would encourage people to do, where just you know, twice a year you can say, on a holiday, I'm going to go work in a, in a soup kitchen or, you know, or some, something like that, and that's a great thing, that's a great thing to do. Um, but I think that for folks like ourselves in the digital world, we actually have a lot more opportunity uh, to give back in many ways. Um, first of all, there's a lot of online opportunities to mentor folks, and later I can send some links around if you want to mentor people virtually from your desk uh, here and take 10 minutes out and, and mentor somebody instead of just checking Facebook. Uh, you, can certainly, you can certainly do that. So there's a lot of online ways and remote ways of doing that. One of the things we're doing in school these days is we're Skyping people into schools. And so one of the programs that I've helped launch Skypes astronauts, uh, NASA astronauts, current and former, into schools around the country where you, do, you can't get an astronaut to visit there, but they Skype in, they talk about what, what it's like to be an astronaut. Uh, again, we can do the same thing here where we, we can have Skype calls in to a school. You can talk about what it means to be you know, in a growth company, tech, and things like that. You can mentor a young engineer uh, or things like that. So uh, using technology as well to, to bring people together I think is also important. One of the things I'd love to see happen more in schools is school-to-school uh, -school collaboration and then both within the city and around the nation, around the world. Imagine if you're a kid growing up in New York City, 
already having a great cultural diversity in New York City, but you can also then Skype to a, uh, another classroom in Israel, as an example, and get a sense of what it's like you know, to be that kid in Israel who's your age, you know, and, and, and collaborate with them on some robotic thing that you build together. Uh, that's the kind of things we can do now. So I would say that even working long hours, one, there's NY Cares, there's a couple of one-off opportunities you can do, you know, whenever you do have the time. But also I would say digitally, there's a lot of ways to connect in. I can send some links around. Okay, for that. Probably have time for one more question, either in New York or you can go to back to Boston right too, or okay. can I ask a question about yeah. the education? I have a son who's um, likely gonna go to a public school next year. How old how is he now? He's three now. Yeah. And unfortunately with the New York law, he's gonna be four in kindergarten, which is anyway, the whole right. story. Um I'm curious what you're going to do, because it's two schools, East Side and TJ, they're both in New York. Like well, TJ is in Virginia, other. and East Side is here, yeah. Are you thinking about building a case study around them to get, because it sounds like the principal, the principals and teachers are the ones who need to be able to force this change in. Like, they need to opt out, and, but you have to be very courageous to do that. I mean, it must be really risky, so, like, how are you going to, like, yeah. how are you going to do well, that? The, sounds awesome. Yeah, the good news is that there's a, there's a nice, growing, critical mass of, of, of principals and teachers who really love some of these approaches. But yes, first I have to start with the mayor and the chancellor. And the chancellor I would choose is somebody who is obviously simpatico with you know, my, my feelings on this and the feelings I think that a lot of us share, which is that you need more autonomy. Going back to the question before about how to attract the best teachers. Um, so first thing you need to do is make sure there's autonomy in the system and the ability for each principal to choose the system that's best for their, for their kids. It's not a one size fits all. We don't want to have a school system where the chancellor says, this is the way it's going to be, right? That we don't want to have that. So, so the first thing I would say is we really got to have a system that opens things up and allows people to have, uh, allows principals and teachers to have that choice. That's, that's the first thing. Second, yes, let's get the word out about Eastside. P-Tech is another example, Pathways in Technology. It's not for your son yet, it's for high school, but when he's ready for high school, maybe a high school that you want to choose, it's a collaboration of IBM, CUNY, and the public school system. It's a six-year course. High school to two years of associate's degree. During the course of six years, you get five to seven internships at IBM and other companies. So by the time you graduate, two years um, post high school, you already have so many skills and so much experience. You are job ready, you're career ready, you're life ready, you're New York City ready because you have all this experience. You get placed immediately in a job. I mean, like, who would not want a kid who spent six years not only learning a lot, engaging in project-based learning and things like that, but was on the job in six different companies and has, mentor, you know, been, has been mentored by top people around the city and now is ready for that kind of self-directed, to be a self-directed employee. Uh, when you guys you know, recruit people here, again, I, I, I haven't seen the recruiting process, but I would guess, just from knowing the culture here, you're not saying, okay, well, you got 100 on Latin and 100 on Greek, so you know, it must be great. You know, I mean, you're looking for other kinds of skill sets here, and, and that's the same thing at Google, it's the same thing at all the best, all the best places. In fact, the, that's where the economy is today. The economy is really moving away from the traditional resume analysis you know, more towards uh, these kinds of skills that we're talking about. So, you know, for your son, I would hope that as mayor starting in January of this coming year, I'd be able to start affecting this change. Maybe in the first year we get 100 schools to opt out and start, you know, getting to these new areas. Maybe by the second year, two or 300. Uh, so by the time your son is ready for middle school and high school, I think there'd be a great, you know, critical mass ready to go. So with that. Thank you, Jack. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, everybody. I'll just, I'll just finish with, again, encouragement. My personal email is jackhittery at gmail.com. So my first name, last name, no dots, at gmail.com. Please email me personally if you have any other further questions or ideas. If you want to volunteer, join us as well. Uh, check us out online at jackformayor.com. And um, we'd we'll love, love to see you out there on the road. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jack. And also, if you're running the marathon, Jack is trying to get a team to go run with them. So, so I'm, I'm, only, I'm only one running as a candidate who's also running the marathon. Um, so if anyone here running the marathon, please let me know. You can run with us.